These are African rhythms passed down to us through ancient spirits. Feel the spirit, a unifying force. Come on, move with the spirit. Stand up, clap your hands. Move with the rhythms, get down. WSNC 90.5 FM, a broadcasting service of Winston-Salem State University. Welcome to Africa World Now Project. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. Today, critical reflections on the organic nature of Africana socio-political thought and cultural resistance with Amir Baraka and Tom Porter. Africa World Now Project is next. <laughs> In his poem, Countries Want Independence, Nations Want Liberation, and The People, The People Want Revolution, Amir Baraka writes, Revolutionary unity gained only through struggle long sought for must be fought for. Revolutionary unity, a fiery beacon in a world made perpetual night by imperialism. The basis of struggle, unity, revolutionary unity, unity gained through struggle, the basis of the party yet to be built in the land of instant everythings, written October 1979. Today, Africa World Now Project will bring you critical reflections on the organic nature of Africana social political thought and cultural resistance through the words of Amir Baraka himself. We will also hear a discussion which took place about a year in remembrance of Amir Baraka's transition between myself and the impeccable Tom Porter. Sit back, listen, reflect, and practice. Our show was produced today in solidarity with the Native, Indigenous, and Afro-descendant communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Cooperation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, and Ghana, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all people. Enjoy the program. Good afternoon, and welcome to our Noon Forum presented by the Associated Student Speakers Program. This afternoon is our pleasure to welcome to our campus poet playwright Leroy Jones. The best introduction that I could give uh, Brother Leroy Jones is to say that he is first of all a brother and then a personal friend, but the first great revolutionary black writer. And we say this in terms of the type of literature that black people are starting to develop and will develop until there is never any need for this again, which is never. And that literature will be based, there you go, that literature, <laughs> you're much too kind. <clears throat> that literature will be based on three principles, principles of literature and writings and philosophy that have been here since the beginning of time, i.e. African writings and concepts. And those concepts are first, all literature must be judged on the basis of whether or not it is functional. Second, it must be judged on the basis of whether or not it is collective. And third, it must be based on whether or not it is committed. And when we say that all literature, writing, philosophy art must be functional, that means we destroy the concept of European literature that there's such a thing as art for art's sake. There is no such thing as art for art's sake. If a man really believed in art for art's sake, he wouldn't try to show his friends his paintings and try to sell them. He would keep them in his little dark room and just drool over himself. <clears throat> But he does not do that. He brings them out so that the world can say he's great. That is not functional, but it suits him egotistically. And what we have to realize is that in Africa, all art was functional. And that if it did not serve a function, it was invalid. 
The function of black literature must serve today is that it promotes and initiates change. And all art and literature that does not suggest and promote change is invalid in terms of black revolutionary literature. Brother Jones's literature does just that. It is functional. Second, all literature must be collective. An artist must always relate to the masses of black people. He must get his inspiration and sense of identity, purpose, and direction from the masses of people. Art cannot be for a small group. It must be for everybody. We must not talk about bringing the masses up to the level of art, but we must make art on the level with the masses so that black people all over can benefit from it because we are no more than the context to which we owe our existence, namely our Afro-American context. We have created soul music and soul poetry and soul art because of black people having this emotional basis for our creation. And as Senghor say, we do not weep when our art is destroyed. We rather try to retain the soul force that made this art possible. That is a black collective soul force. And some of you out there and who have tendencies toward intellectualism might say that soul is an unscientific concept. Well, it's not. It's extra scientific, and we will allow no scientific disproof of it. <clears throat> so then the art must be collected. The last uh, standard is that all art must be committed. That is, it must commit the artist, and it must commit the person who observes the art. And if it does not do that, then it is invalid. It must commit black people to revolutionary change. It must commit black people to having a black identity. It must commit black people to having a black purpose. It must commit black people to having a black direction. And once these things have been achieved, then how can we say that this art is no longer valid? It will always be valid as long as it provides us with the identity, the purpose, and the direction we need as black people in a country that is basically racist. And what you want to do today is to listen to what Brother Leroy says and try to understand it from the context from which we speak. Naturally, we speak a different language. In spite of Negro opinion, we are not just Americans. We are Afro-Americans, and the context to which we owe our existence is first black, because we were black before we were born. It was only later, and we haven't really even decided that yet, that we are American, because they're still debating that in Congress with Civil Rights Bill. <clears throat> So I would like to conclude by saying that Brother Leroy is from a revolutionary black writer's school. And we love this brother because he teaches us change and he makes that teaching a very beautiful thing. We always say that inspiration comes before education. In our school of Afro-American culture, we teach children heroic images and concepts that inspire them to learn because academic assertions have more value in philosophy classes than they do in the streets. And black people are and shall be for a long time just there in the streets. Thank you, Brother Leroy. That poetry festival is called Against Bourgeois Art. War on the horizon, a ship with bloody sail, Andy Young slips on his Chamberlain appeasement get up he got from years listening to the CP hype Martin Luther King. Is there somebody here to record this? The U.S. being thrown out the front door? the Russian bear charging through the back door. My man, suddenly clearly an apologist for new style colonialism, telling us we can't fight in the US. Those centuries of our dead are buried here. Oceans of our blood have fertilized a black nation in the South. 
Is there someone here to get this down? Can I get a, like they say, witness? An eye that can see through this here. In Jimmy Carter's snake oil show, there is a room nobody talks about. Steel door, fumes seep underneath. Inside, blood and hair on the floor. Bones stacked in the corner. Photos of Goering and Goebbels and Joe McCarthy and Nixon in the nude, trying to put helmets on their pecker woods. Will somebody put this stuff out? You walk through a museum, all the colors of the spectrum, right there, but not one image, except of checks passing. Pollock dollar signs, de Kooning fortunes, Larry Rivers pots at the end of the rainbow. No people, no love, no heart and soul insides flowing out. No fighting in the street, no fires rip the sky, no children screaming death, no police, no state. Except it is the state sitting on the wall. No people struggle, just colors thrown by baby snoops. A down and leaving unintellectual. No record of this place. As wild a mug and joint as America is, somebody should shut down. Otherwise, no one will believe it. Get it down. Get it on the record. Get the hate, the horror, the lies, the Rockefeller monsters eating corpses. Hey, bro, say hey, what it is, dude? Hey, two, two, do it is you. Wow, loud, duty roo, baby, baby, be. Carrying a radio on his shoulder. Eating corpses, coal mines, garment center, assembly line. Hot steaming steel poured through space. Not any of life is there. Hey, poet, you artist. He turns in the shadows, sucking a marble, dribbling Andy Warhol's lost nut. He is an artist. He is a poet, a po nine, too. His work is about everything. His work is about the universe. Her work is about the universe. Her work is about stars belching. Her work is about gray hair, lost in the desert, peeped in a teeny voice. No babies, no screams, no red life, no future. Death peeped in a teeny voice. Stupidity dripped in a sultry voice. Bourgeois poets yodel nonsense about boring absence. They think up funny ways for letters to sit on the page. Concrete did, already done it. They are safe as old toilet paper. Revolution sweeps the world. Bourgeois artists stare at crumbs of dust in the light. People change reality. But these dull imitation poets talk to us of fragmented nothingness. Like two cell creatures trying to be bop. The world is heavier than they know. They do not know. They fight knowledge with abstraction and think they cool because they talk to themselves. They are full of like vultures pecking on an open grave. They uphold dying capitalism and give themselves airs. They think they shit is profound and complex. But the people think it's as profound and complex as monkey farts. Now, meditate. I'm a poet. A uh, writer, I guess you'd say. And, uh, a political activist, you know, I'm a Marxist, you know, I was uh, born in Newark, New Jersey, 1934. Uh, finally, I went away to college. But, uh, I went to, uh, first I went to Rutgers, Newark, when there was no black people in there. <laughs> and then I went to Howard University, 
and was thrown out of Howard University after three years. Uh, then I joined the Air Force because I was embarrassed to be kicked out of college and I uh, got kicked out of the Air Force. So I mean, it's just, I was going two for two, actually. And then I came to, to New York, you know. Uh, I started writing poetry really, uh, well, I started when I was a little boy, you know. I had a newspaper when I was about 10. The newspaper had 10 copies that I had to write by hand and I would pass them out to people in the community. So I must have had that feeling of wanting to communicate a long time ago, early. And I took a writing class in high school my last year. And uh, in college, I started trying to write a little bit. <clears throat> One thing that turned me on, you know, I mean, a lot of stuff that turned me on to writing. I mean, uh, Langston Hughes early in my life. E, e, at one point, even E. e. Cummings and Pound and people like that. Um, but then when I went to Howard, something happened. I read, a co I read a collection of Garcia Lorca translated by Langston Hughes called, uh, you know, uh, Gypsy Ballads, Gitano. And um, that made me think that I wanted to really be a poet, a writer, because that was the, 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 the way, and the way Langston had translated it was so beautiful. You know, when you get two great poets like that together, Lorca and Langston Hughes, you get a kind of sensuousness that you wouldn't get otherwise, you know, because Langston spoke Spanish. And uh, then I went to the service, and I, w I was a weatherman in a B-36 bomb. I was a weather gunner. But at night, I was the base librarian. You know, this woman discovered that I had a feeling for books, and I never saw her no more. She gave me the keys, and that was it. She was gone. And uh, I used to be in the library, me and about six or seven dudes, and I ordered all the books, all the records, and we actually taught ourselves the history, I guess, of Western literature, the history of Western music in that library every night. You know, we'd sit in there three or four hours till it was lights out all over the base, and what we would be doing is talking talking, talking, reading, 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 listening to music. And that was my real education, I think. I was stationed in Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. And, uh, and that, you know, I, uh, <clears throat> I mean, that was a very interesting kind of uh, thing because uh, it was still, it was like the South of the United States, you know. Only they treated the Puerto Ricans like there was the blacks in the South, you know. If you had your uniform on, you could go to those hotels, but the locals couldn't go. This is in, this is in Viejo San Juan, you know. Uh, <laughs> but that was a, you know, it was a good experience for me in the sense I hated it. <laughs> but at the same time, I taught myself, we taught each other a great deal, you know. Then I got out and I came to uh, New York. You know, I wanted to be a writer then. I came to New York. And, uh, <clears throat> got an apartment for $28 a month, three rooms, no heat. You know, you had to put your, your feet in the, in, the, in the oven to stay warm, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was New York. My mother, would, my mother and father brought me over to that apartment, man, and they came in with towels and stuff. And when they saw that apartment, my mother started crying. She said, <laughs> oh my God, my son, what has he done? <laughs> no, they couldn't understand it, you know, but you know, I thought it was hip, you know. Greenwich Village, 1957. You know, uh, first time I'm living by myself, you know, trying to write. I got a job the next day in a bookstore, which was a famous bookstore. I didn't know it. Gotham Bookmark, famous bookstore, you know. I mean, I delivered books to famous writers, you know. I mean, that's how it, I didn't, I didn't know what it was. I just walked in there and said, I want a job. It's okay. <laughs> but, uh, and that's how I got into the New York thing. I had read about Allen Ginsberg in the newspapers in Puerto Rico when the paper, The Village Voice, came out, the first editions, I got those. You know, when Mayor Koch was liberal, when Norman Mailer was on the, on the editorial board, you know, and uh, I'd read about this cow, you know, they were banning the book, you know, for these words. And by that time, I was sending poetry out once a week, and it was coming back the next week. You know, I was sending it out to these journals, and the poetry would come right back with, you know, rejection slips. 
So when I read about this guy who had written this book and the police wanted to lock him up, I said, I got to meet this guy. <laughs> he must be doing something right. That's just before I got kicked out of the Air Force, you know, for, uh, why did I get kicked out of here? I got kicked out of the Air Force. They said I was a communist. They, they were visionaries, actually, because I thought I was a Buddhist, you know what I mean? It just shows you they were, they were reading into the future, you know? <laughs> yeah, the guy said, you're a communist. What do you mean, man? But anyway, so I came to New York, and that's, that was the beginning of my, uh, my literary career. I met all those people. I mean, New York in the 19, late 50s and 60s was like no place in the world, you know, like no place in the world, you know. And the world was like no place. I mean, the stuff that was happening all over the world, you know. I mean, to be there in New York at that time. Remember, I came out of service in 57. 58, the Montgomery bus boycott. They blew up King's house. You understand, 59, Fidel Castro. 60, Malcolm X appears for the first time. I'm in Cuba in 1960. SNCC starts in 1960, February 1st, 1960. The Greensboro, you know, sit-ins. The whole student movement begins then. And as a young man then, I'm trying to deal with literature and the whole question of revolution, you know, all trying to figure out how you do that. And then a call came one Saturday and said, would you like to go to Cuba to take Langston Hughes' place? <laughs> so that's, that's the kind of uh, incredible stuff, you know. Some dude said, you want to go to Cuba? Because Langston couldn't go or didn't want to go. I said, yeah, why not? I mean, you know, it's cool. Let's go. And uh, that's how I got to Cuba, you know. Uh, July 1960. You know, so that's one year after the revolution in Cuba. You know, the people still walking around with guns. You know, they brought students from all over Latin America and all these European intellectuals, you know, Simone de Beauvoir, Sartre, all those people, all descended on Havana. And then we took about a 14-hour train ride from Havana to Oriente, you know. And we went up to uh, Sierra Maestra, where Fidel spoke. He spoke about two hours that day, maybe two and a half hours, I swear to God, in the hot sun, you know. But you know, the question was, that didn't even matter. You, you, you understand? And you were transfixed in that kind of thing, you know. Except I was so, I was so dry, I went, you know, I needed some water. I didn't have a canteen, you know. I was thirsty. We were sitting out in the sun, you know. The, it, the dog on the, what do you call it? The, the farmers had those big hats. You know, they was hip to what was happening. But I'm out there with my head, and it's just baking me, baking me. So I said, I got to get some water. I got to get some water. So then I see these milicianos go up to this faucet coming out of the ground, you know. And, you know, the, the young militia people, they go and they start drinking this water, man. They drinking this water. I said, great, great. I would never drink that water, man. I had diarrhea for the rest of the time in Cuba. You know? so, <laughs> I finally had to destroy a paper with my picture in it, you know. <laughs> because it wouldn't stop, you know what I mean? I mean, it was some water that they could drink because they, you know, that's their they're element. Yeah, they're used to it. That's their element. I said, well, you know, they're drinking. It's cool. <laughs> it wasn't cool, you know. <laughs> no, it wasn't cool. I met Fidel then, that day, in Sierra Maestra. I wrote a... I wrote a an essay about that called Cuba Libre that won a, an award, you know, show you the double, the duplicity of American life, you know. Uh, I met Che Guevara, he gave us a lecture when we was down there. Uh, Juan Almeida, who was the, you know, commandante of the army. Uh, a lot of the, the Cuban poets, you know. Um, but see, I wasn't political. I was coming, becoming, I guess, political. What, I got on this train with all these Latin American writers, these poets and stuff, and they were harassing me for 14 hours about America. You know, this bourgeois country, blah, 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 blah. I said, hey, man, I'm not political. I'm a poet. You know, what do you mean you're a poet? Yeah, how can you be a poet? And you, you're not political. So I had to hear that for 14 hours, you know. So when every time they would come to one of these little towns, all of the students would say, you know, Viva Cuba Libre, or, you know, uh, uh, you know, Unidad y Lucha, uh, <laughs> Vinceremos, and I would say, Viva 42nd Street, you know, 
Viva Charlie Parker. <laughs> because I didn't really have anything to say. You understand? I mean, in the sense of, of, of a revolutionary sense. But it's interesting that, that that year, Malcolm X first appeared. That's the first year he actually appeared on television, 1960. So it all came together. Plus, also, uh, Robert Williams was there. Uh, you know, Robert Williams, who in Monroe, North Carolina, was head of NAACP, and uh, he was fired from the NAACP because he had led um, he led sit-ins, swim-ins. They wouldn't let the black people swim in the pool. They climb over the fence. They swim in. They have swim-ins. They go to the library. Have read-ins. They attacked the Klan. The Klan was marching. They ambushed the Klan and took their hoods off and discovered that they were the state police. But they did that the week over after the Lumbee Indians. The Lumbee Indians did it first. And then Rob and them, who was an ex-Marine, they did it. Then the NACP fired him for head of the NACP because he said you have to meet violence with violence. In 1950, 1958, that was 59, that was out. You couldn't say things like that. You have to meet violence with violence, he said. And finally, he went into exile because they attacked his house, you see. And they wanted to charge him with kidnapping some, a white couple whose life he had saved, and he fled to Cuba. And the Cubans, you know, gave him amnesty, uh, Fidel, and then later he went to China. Uh, but Robert Williams is a great um, little-known story of the whole civil rights movement. He was one of the first militants and not just rapping militancy, but actually the confrontation with the Klan, straight out. You know, I mean, I can tell you some stories, but it too, it might be a little too too much uh, <laughs> bad language. But Rob Williams actually took me to to the American Embassy in Cuba when the the Klan was attacking his his house, disguised as the state police. It was really because they all they do is take off their robes and they the state police. They were attacking. He took me to the Klan. I mean, he took me to, to the Klan. He took me to the, the the embassy and went to the American ambassador and pulled out a gun and said, "MF, you either gonna call North Carolina and get them people off my land. I'm gonna blow MF it off." See, that's who Robert Williams was, you know. And I was standing there as, of course, an innocent bystander. That's what, what my claim is. I'm an innocent bystander. <laughs> I didn't know what he was gonna do, you know, but. Uh, Cuba taught me a lot of things. First, that young people actually, if they organized and understood what they was doing, they could make revolution. I understood that very clearly. Because all those people were my age. They were all in their 30s. You know, Fidel was barely 40 then. You know, Che Guevara, they were in their late 30s and 40s. They were young people. We were all young people. You know, you can understand that. It wasn't like an old dude or something like that. These were young people. You know, all the poets were young people, you know. These people in their 20s, they were old as I was, you know. So that was why I was so influenced by that. I always say that Malcolm X and Fidel Castro, my two heroes of the 20th century, you know. You have to understand that. When Fidel came to Harlem <laughs> and met with Malcolm X, which was the, one of the shrewdest things that was ever done, because when the people wouldn't let him in down, you know, saying you're too militant to be, you know, we're not going to let you in these midtown hotels. He went to Hotel Teresa on her 25th Street. And you know, he had all the Barbudos, all the bearded, you know, army people out on the balcony all the time, and the people just circled Teresa. You know what I mean? Just circled. They'd be sitting out on that balcony eating chicken, you know, and they'd be like, hey, hey, what's happening? But that was like a political coup, you know, and Fidel has done that relentlessly to these people. They're not smart enough to actually do anything. They think they can do something, but they never can quite. Even when they get those terrorists, like this guy, uh, you know, Posada Carides, you know, these terrorists who blow up airplanes, blow up airports, they still can't win, you know. Uh, so that was the beginning of my real understanding, you know, the Malcolm X, Fidel Castro, that was my understanding of politics in the 20th century, you know. Uh, my son just went down to Cuba a couple of times the last years. My wife and I went to Caracas two years ago to the conference uh, in defense of humanity. And uh, what was really ironic about that, I was getting beat up then by the press about this poem, Somebody Blew Up America, you know what I mean? Blah, 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 blah. 
So when I go to, to, to Venezuela, I get off the plane, there's a billboard, biggest damn room with my picture on it, you know what I mean? <laughs> Myself, uh, Alice Walker, uh, Danny Glover, you know, all this huge billboard, you know, because we were going down there for this conference. And when I was in the conference, another thing, Chavez is answering questions. He answered questions about four or five hours worth of questions. We thought we was going to eat at 8 o'clock. We ended up at 12 o'clock. We sat there answering questions. People lined up and kept asking him questions. questions. So a guy comes in the place, and I said to my wife, I said, I know that guy here. I know that guy. I can't identify him, but I know him. So he shook hands, he sat down. And so then Chavez says, and now I want to introduce the great Algerian revolutionary, Ben Bella. And I was sitting behind Ben Bella. I couldn't believe it, you know, who still looks great, still looks great. But then I went to the Encyclopedia Britannica because I was writing an article on, you know, the, the whole visit to uh, Caracas. And uh, there is no mention of Ben Bella. <laughs> you look up Algeria, the Algerian Revolution, there's no mention of Ben Bella. So all the kids who come up looking for that, there's no Ben Bella in there. They don't know that. You know, they might know about the FALN and, uh, you know, the fact that uh, Algerian revolutionaries overthrew the French, so forth. But you find out more information in the Battle of Algiers, that movie, than you will from the Encyclopedia Britannica. We are listening to critical reflections of the organic nature of Africana social political thought and cultural resistance with Amir Baraka in his own words and through selected work and reflections on his life with one of his closest friends and brother in struggle, Tom Porter. Our show was produced today in solidarity with the native, indigenous, and Afro-descendant communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, and Ghana and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all people. Enjoy the rest of the tour. So that's where my politics comes from. You know, I was a, 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 when Malcolm was murdered, I left the village and moved to Harlem, organized the Black Arts Repertory Theater School. Was slashed in one year. And really, fundamentally, why it split up is because uh, black is not an ideology. You know, we're saying black, black this, black this, black this. But what black are you talking about? You're talking about nationalists? You're talking about Muslim? You're talking about Christian? You're talking about communists? What, what kind of black are you talking about? You understand? So in the end, it actually ended up people shooting each other. I mean, that's how violent that got, you know. Uh, but we did some good things. Uh, we went to Harlem. Right after Malcolm was killed, Malcolm was killed in February. We were in Harlem by March. All summer we organized. We, we had five trucks every night going out in this, all through the summer. One truck had music on it. One had poetry. One had drama. You know what I mean? One had dance. And we would send the trucks to parks, to vacant lots you know, to play streets every night. We would move them around, just like an army. We would move them around, and that's how the whole black arts movement spread nationally, the fact that we hammered at it. Because our idea was that we had to bring the most advanced, the most advanced art, that why should we reserve what we thought was so hip for a downtown Greenwich Village? You know, why don't we bring that into our community and see what happens, you see? and. Uh, that has a profound effect. You, 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 you don't understand how much effect it has, you know, the stuff that they hear on, say, the radio and stuff, what that is. And then if you bring the most advanced artists into, you know, not just what the, what the stations are willing to play, but the most advanced, bring that in there and see. You know, like people were saying, Sun Ra is so out. Sun Ra, nobody could dig Sun We brought Sun Ra to Harlem and people start dancing. Mm -hmm. You know, it was out, but they knew what to do with it. They, they would be dancing. You know what I mean? So, so that question of no matter how advanced you think your stuff is, go back to the people. See the reaction they have to it. See how they, how they dig it, what they think about it, you know. I mean, there's a poet named Tony Medina. That's a famous line from his poem. He repeats, the people dig it, MF. The people dig it, you know what I mean? It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's that 
is your final judge of what you do, the people. That's your judge. You know, I tell my students, my writing students that all the time. You think you're so hip? You see them dudes digging that hole over there? When they get ready to sit down and have their sandwich for lunch, go over there and read them a poem. See if they'll listen to it or whether they hit you in the head with something. And then you'll, you'll find out whether your stuff, whether your stuff is strong enough. You know, <laughs> can you read to them people, them guys with them hard hats on? Try that. You know what I mean? So, naturally, some will, and that's good because it gives them the confidence that what they're doing is worthwhile. You know. Um, I don't know, and some of the other questions we were talking about, if you might talk about that, the whole question of black-brown unity is important to me because in the fabled 60s, which is really a couple of decades when they say the 60s, you're talking about the 60s, the 70s, uh, the, f the building block of all of that civil rights movement and the black liberation movement was unity between nationalities. That's the bottom line, you know, the bottom line was that. So that uh, for instance, I give you a small instance and a large instance, the same thing. In 1970, you know, uh, and of course, I mean, I, I could go back further. I mean, the greatest thing that I would, would say, of course, I'd tell you about Fidel, but if you ever look at the 1961 flick with Du Bois and Mao Zedong in Tiananmen Square, you know, where he says, Africa learned from China. Africa learned from China. That speech, you know, read that speech about the unity of all people struggling. The Bandung Conference, again, that Malcolm was talking about, the unity of the third world people, the unity of the colonial, the people who have been made colonies, that unity, very important. You know, um, Huey Newton visiting, you know, in, uh, you know, China. Malcolm X traveling around Africa. You know, these are, these are important, important things, you know. So that in 19, uh, what was it, 71, the racists in Newark, in the Italian section, were burning down these Puerto Ricans' houses, and I told you about that before. We declared a mutual defense pact with the young lords, myself and Felipe Luciano, who's still a close friend of mine. We declared a defense, defense pact, an attack on us is an attack on them, an attack on them is an attack on us. The racists sent a telegram, to the governor asking, was that legal? We said, attack on the Puerto Rican community is attacking the black community. Attack on the black community is attacking. Now, there is 60 some percent of that community is black, you know, and at the time, at least 15 percent was Puerto Rican. Now it's much larger than that. So the idea of them actually seeing all of those people coming after them was enough to make them get off it. And that's what you have to do. You have to see that unity. And so now, um, you know, another strong, you know, connection we have is a brother named Corky Gonzalez from, uh, you know, Colorado was a strong. And then Tijerina with the land seizures. You know, all of those things, and uh, all of those things are important. But the Young Lords Black Panther unity was very important. And because of the, the strength of those movements, you had People like Iwar Kong from you know, the Chinese National Movement, uh, the Red Guards, uh, the Asian National Movement, the Young Pioneers, the white, poor white people's movement. You, they turned everybody on, you see, because the question was unity and struggle. Unity and struggle. Unida, unida, he lucha. That was, the, that was the question. And we all knew then, you know, when, when, uh, when Nazi tongue said, you know, uh, you know, nations, no, countries want independence, nations want liberation, and people want revolution. That cry for us was a universal cry. You know, we used to say, that was Mao, we used to say, revolution is the main trend in the world today. We loved to say that in the 60s. We would always say, revolution is the main trend in the world today, no matter what you say, police, you know, or city council. Revolution is the main trend in the world today. It's not today. Revolution is not the main trend in the world today. The main trend in the world today is what? Neo-fascism, repression, war, you know. So that question of how do you now reverse that, the struggle against imperialism, the struggle against neo-fascism, and one of the, the, the things that they're doing is trying to divide the black and brown communities. You see what's happening in uh, 
at Los Angeles, mm -hmm. you see, that's very, very, very dangerous because the more that happens, the easier both of us can get killed. That's all it is. And, you know, that's the first lesson if you take Latin <laughs> in, in a book called Caesar's Commentaries. That's the first Latin. All Gaul is divided into three parts. Keep it that way. In other words, he, he's saying when, you know, the Romans conquered France, Gaul, all Gaul is divided into three parts. Keep it that way. Maintain that division. So that's, I mean, they tell you that's a long, long, old, old struggle, and that's what's happening to us now. They're trying to use the Latinos uh, and the blacks to divide them the same way they divided white and black workers, although the white workers had much more racism in them, but still, they would get the blacks to work for less, and then the whites would resent that. They would get the Latinos to work for less, and the blacks will resent that. But the question is, you have to see who's doing that and get them unified and attack the doers of that, not each other, you see. Because if you attack each other, you fall into their trap. You know, you fall into their trap. And people say, well, don't you think we need allies? If somebody's beating your head, would you rather have somebody watching it? Join the enemy? Or jump him, <laughs> you know. What I mean? That's 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 simple. It seemed to me. If you've been in the street, you know, you know, get that sucker here. <laughs> but that's where we are now, and and it's up to us to 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 fight against that division. It's up to us to fight that, you know, to fight that, you know, like, uh, you know, you mentioned Albert Gonzalez. It's true. If you're with Albert Gonzalez or, or Condoleezza Rice. You know, they all go when the wagon comes. You understand? I mean, because they do not serve us. There's no ethnic ties with them. They serve imperialism. That's all. You know, I tell you what she said. You know, she said, they asked her, did you think about the civil rights movement? She said, uh, uh, you know, um, I was in college and I was learning to play the piano. And uh, I never thought much about the counterculture. I said, the counterculture? You mean we the counterculture? That mean your mom and father was the counterculture? No, just us, the ones struggling against. Because you know her father was even against Dr. King, Condoleezza Rice. You know, I mean he lived there. I mean, in, what was that? Where were the, the the Birmingham where they blew up the blew up the church and killed those four little girls? She went to the same church. You understand that? But her that was part of the black bourgeoisie that was opposed to. King opposed to them. You see, it's not no simple ethnic kind of connection. It's about ideology and commitment. So then there's people in Birmingham who was against King, black people. But now when Birmingham is desegregated, they benefit too. You understand? She said the civil rights, again, Condoleezza Rice, she said the civil rights movement wasn't really necessary. They let my parents go into the stores on the weekend. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's outrageous. Oh, that's what you think it was about? Going in the stores? You think it wasn't, it wasn't about equality and self-determination. It was about going in the stores, you know. I saw my grandmother go into a store one time down south, and the lady wouldn't let us try that stuff on. She threw it down. I said, I don't, <laughs> I'm not interested in that, you know. But that, it, the clarity on us, our class divisions within our own nationalities, you know, they're clear. What they call in, in, in Spanish, uh, what, the vende patria, the people who sell the country. You know, what they call, they call the compradors. You know, the people that work for imperialism, who look like you. You know, what Cabral called native agents, you know. So, we have to begin to look for classes and class struggle. And in the 70s, we thought we understood that. The whole left, the new left was a multinational left, you know. W understood that you would always come in when Hugh Masekela came in um, with his with his with his uh, his voice and his trumpet. We knew Tom Tom Porter was about to come on. I just had to introduce your presence with that um, with that uh, uh, clip right there. That's cool. <laughs> I wanted to um, continue um, continue our journey, and I, I couldn't think of anybody else that would probably be able to kind of contextualize our our conversation. Um, um, better than you could, and I wanted to start out with this with this question. Um, it's pretty broad, but then we can go from there. Um, how can we truly begin to understand the contributions of Amir Baraka? Well, uh, you know, 
first of all, you should read him and study his works. And it's important when you study any artist or a person like uh, a Mary Baraka, who was more than just a poet, more than just an artist, more than just a writer, but he was, uh, he used all of his skills in the interest of making the world a better place, particularly uh, for African American and, and black people. And, um, um, you know, Mary Baraka had many, many different phases of his life. He started off as a poet in the village, moved uptown to Harlem, moved back to Newark and organized the city of, of Newark. And his organizing of the city of Newark led to his son becoming the mayor of, of, of Newark. He was committed to the liberation of black people, but he also was a great humanist uh, and a great internationalist. The unfortunate thing is is that people tend to put him, want to put him in a box. And I'm reminded of something that Arnett Coleman's son said at his father's homecoming, that my father didn't believe in thinking outside of the box. In fact, he didn't believe that there were boxes. And that's kind of how I would sum up uh, Amiri Baraka. And uh, we were talking about this uh, briefly the, uh, uh, the other day when we were talking about, you talked about this evolution. People tend to kind of uh, um, put him into a box. Let's situate Amiri Baraka in, in a long tradition of social political African and African and diasporic social political thought of resistance. How, how can we understand Amiri Baraka's um, contributions in a, in a larger context? Because, after all, I'm speaking of, I mean, individuals such as yourself and other individuals are contributing as well. This evolution, uh, how, how do we understand this evolution of thought and how and why is it that people want to kind of context or, or place people in the box? Why, I mean, why is that an important to kind of like not understand the evolution of a person? That's well, the, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. There's something that you learn and struggle. As a matter of fact, Lerone Bennett said it best. He wrote a piece in the 60s called Struggle is the Highest Form of Education. So if you've ever been involved in struggle, uh, and people do the same thing with the civil rights movement, they say that the civil rights movement was this. Well, uh, the civil rights movement was nonviolent, and, you know, uh, but the civil rights movement moved through different phases as it moved through different phases of struggle. Similarly, uh, Amiri Baraka, as he struggled, struggle leads to solutions to problems and then creates other problems. And so Amiri Baraka, be, you know, moved based on his involvement in struggle and an understanding of what was needed. Um, and, and most people tend to want to center him uh, in the world of black nationalism or the black arts movement, and he never ceased to be that. He never ceased to be a nationalist, but his understanding of the relationship between national liberal, national nationalism and national liberation, which are two different things, and internationalism is yet a third thing. And so he moved from being a poet to a nationalist, at one point, he called himself a Sunni Muslim soothsayer. He moved into Pan-Africanism, which in its truest form is a, is, is, is a form of socialism. Uh, if you think about the founders of the Pan-African movement, Du Bois, Padmore, uh, and those. And so he, he was part of founding something called the Congress of African People. Uh, he also, what you learn to do in struggle, he also always had something that he was putting out in a written form, uh, cricket, a number of different, in struggle you learn how to do that. You have to have some way of speaking to the people. I mean, and so you do newspapers, newsletters, which you passed out. Uh, and so he moved through all of these phases as, as he traveled around the world. Uh, he was one of the uh, first people to go to Cuba after the revolutions, one in the first group, and he wrote a piece called Cuba Libre. Um, he ended up by saying that from a philosophical standpoint, he was, he was more kindred to socialism and communism, uh, 
than any other ideology. And, of course, people try and put them in a box there. I mean, these are different things that you go through. If you engage in struggle, you learn as you go, and you become more knowledgeable as you study and read. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that that's the life of Amiri Amiri Rocker. But he never ceased to be he never ceased to be a poet, a jazz poet, uh, a revolutionary, a nationalist. But you know, all of these you evolve, and in the process of evolving, you move forward with the things that you needed from the last phase, and that that you don't need, you move past it. That's called a negation of the negation. Mm-hmm. I wanted to pull in this thought that you that you just laid out. You talked about uh, Pan Africanism being as closely associated with socialism, and I'm and I'm looking at this idea of Pan Africanism and also looking at it at, as it being um, not within the dominant discourse within struggles or within movements even today. Um, I'm looking at the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm looking at certain aspects of people, um, um, even on the, the the black on campus. There seems to be not uh, a connection with the the internationalist aspect of that. So you, would, because of that, I would argue that you don't have a Pan African um, perspective um, there. Because would you? How how would you pull in that? What would you? I mean, you you, you closely associate a Pan Africanism being with socialism. Is that one of the reasons? That Pan Africanism is not within the dominant discourse of struggle, even looking at the United States and also other places in the diaspora. Well, you know, uh, one of the problems that that's always been there in the in 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 the so-called Black movement is the fear of socialist or Pan Africanist ideas or quote Marxism, uh, and the fact of it is. It's silly to have that position because it has not been there has not been a successful revolution against capitalism, and that's what we're up against and imperialism. That's what we're up against, any way you want to call it. There has not been a successful revolution which was not at its roots, at its base, rooted in the desire to have a better society, whether you call it socialism, Marxism. Pan Africanism. These are ways of organizing people ideologically, uh, based on the concrete conditions that they find themselves in. So, whether you talk about the, the Vietnamese Revolution, the Cuban Revolution, the Russian Revolution, uh, PAIGC and Guinea Bazaar, MPLA, uh, in Angola, uh, uh, the the South African Revolution, you know, at its core. But there are always these warring factions and. To the degree that the black movement runs away from that, they will not be successful. And Malcolm understood that. King understand that. I always say to people, here's my team, Du Bois, Martin, Malcolm. And I name all the people on my team. So I said, where's your team? So we need to grow up, and Baraka understood that. We need to grow up, understand uh, what change and how change takes place and what, what are the ideological foundations that we should build that on. And as Malcolm said, and Baraka would concur, you look around the world and you see how people um, who have the same problem as yours solve their problems, and you know how to get get your problems straight. To the degree that we don't understand that, and Amiri Baraka understood that, uh, to the degree that we don't understand that, we're not going anywhere. And, and 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 what platform? I mean, looking at those because it, again, I mean, people tend to look at things in a very narrow way. So they're, when they're looking at these particular struggles, for some for for it's not a strange reason, but you're looking at it through the lens of a capitalist system. So it automatically divides things based upon racial or class, you know, class or gender. How how uh, Amir Baraka used culture as a as a tool, right? Hey, hey, could you ex- hey. yeah? Could you explain how? how that was integral into moving into his evolution and also moving forward. You know, Amiri Baraka understood something that Amilcar Cabral said, that culture is, one, a product of history. It is a product of our history, whether we're talking about the jazz or the blues or the painting and the writing. It is a product of our history moving forward through struggle. But... For culture to be meaningful, it not only has to be a, a, 
a product of history, but it has to be a determinant of history. And so Baraka understood that culture was a weapon in struggle, whether it's a poem, you know, whether it's a novel. Everything Amiri Baraka did was a weapon in struggle. You know, culture devoid of struggle doesn't mean anything at all. Mm-hmm. Simply doesn't mean anything. But these are things that you learn, that we learn, going through struggle. We didn't start off this way, but we began to understand what was the nature of culture, the importance of culture, uh, how culture is used as a part of struggle. And if we, you look at any revolution or social change movement, and you would find that culture was used because it, it is a creation of the people. But to use it is not, it's not for it to be static, but to use it as a weapon and struggle. Mm-hmm. And, if it, and if it doesn't do that, it doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the pieces that we, we play coming out of, um, coming out of the break was Amir Baraka's class struggle in music. He looked at the class struggle in music and he began to write a poem with that and he did that. Uh, uh, you're familiar with that piece, uh, right? Class struggle in music with Amir Baraka. And I forget the other individuals who were doing, who was on that, on that piece with him. David Murray. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, there was Baraka worked with musicians. He he uh worked with musicians, um always understanding that that our music in particular is a guiding light in our struggle. It's always been. Um whether it's popular music, you know, whether it's uh Smokey Robinson saying just like a desert shows a a, a thirsty man, a green oasis where there's only sand. The love I saw in you, just a mirage. You may think that's just a song, but uh, it's it's about our relationship to this country. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, w. B. Uh, du Bois, Souls of Black Folk. He started out each of his his essays in there looking at a Negro spiritual, a, a specific song. Uh, yeah, the sorrow songs, right? Oh yeah, the song song. So. So, you know, there are things that you learn and struggle, I guess, that, that's it. And to the degree that the Black Lives Movement continues to struggle, it will understand things uh, better. Hopefully they will read more and study um, what has gone on before, what worked and didn't work. You know, I you know, I don't want to talk uh, about the Black Lives Movement. I mean, each generation, uh, as for Norm said, must find its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. So... Mm-hmm. You know, I'm 76 years old, so I'm not, I'm not trying to tell people how they ought to wage their struggle. I'll share with them how we waged ours, mm-hmm. and hopefully something can come out of that. Indeed, it should, and indeed, again, if the, if the struggle keeps moving, I wanted to take the time to to really thank you for giving me. I know you're going, you know, you have a lot of other things going on. I'm not going to hold you too long, but we're definitely going to have a more expanded version, um, 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 conversation on some other topics moving forward. Uh, thank you for taking the time with uh, um, to speak with us for a little bit, uh, bit today, um, Professor Border. Thank you. I mean, I'm always uh, uh, happy to speak on uh, my friend. Uh, of Mary Baraka, you know, I miss him, and I'd, I'd like to take this time to pay my respects to uh, the, the family of our departed heroine, uh, Sister Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, and to the family of, of Robert Rhodes, who passed away a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, these uh, tall trees, big trees in our forest, mm-hmm. both of them, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing and Dr. Robert Rhodes. Uh, most people never heard of uh, Robert Rhodes, but I can say this unashamedly, unashamedly, that that Robert Rhodes is the smartest human being I ever met in my life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if you don't know who he was or is, you missed something. Yeah, you had him on your you had him on your program a number of times, and and man, y'all used to go. Something in the way of things. That's it for Africa World Now Project for this week. I would like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to spending time with you next week. We can be reached through all your regular social media platforms, email Project at gmail.com, or follow us on Twitter at A-F-W-R-L-D-N-W-P-R-J. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. The Africa World Now Project Collective consists of international media journalists, executive producer and human rights activist, Mwiza Muntali, Africa World Now Project media correspondent, Funa Ngunda, senior researcher and 
content contributor, Dr. Tasneem Sadiqi. Technology advisor is Byron Gray of Grayworks Technology. And creative director is Judah Pope. Africa World Now Project is heard every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WSNC, NPR affiliate, and broadcast service of Winston-Salem State University. Shows are archived weekly on SoundCloud. Search Africa World Now Project. Until next week, be safe, be peaceful, and above all, be intelligent. It's so funny. You follow me down the street. Greeting everybody like the good humor man, and they got the taste of good humor with no ice cream. It's like that. Me talking across people into the houses and not seeing the beings crowding around me with ice picks. You could see them. But they look like important Negroes on the way to your funeral. They look like important jigaboos on the way to your auction. They let them chance the numbers and use an ivory point at a count of teeth.